Hello and good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's Town Hall on the financial challenges faced by communities, consumers in rural communities. We are excited to be here on the campus of Great Falls College at Montana State University. My name is Karen Andre, and I am the Associate Director for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's Consumer Education and External Affairs Office. The CFPB is a 21st century agency that, that implements and enforces federal consumer financial law and ensures that markets for consumer financial products are fair, transparent, and competitive. We are pleased to be here in Great Falls, Montana, and we are grateful to those of you who are joining us here today, including public officials, community leaders, advocates, industry representatives, small business owners, and of course, consumers. We know some of you have traveled far distances, long distances to be here with us today, and we're so grateful to have you with us. We are especially pleased to have Commissioner Melanie Hall of the Montana Division of Banking and Financial Institutions with us, as well as a representative from Senator Tester's office. Let me spend a few moments just explaining to you what is going to happen today at this event. We'll kick off the event with remarks from some special guests. After that, CFPB Director Rohit Chopra will provide remarks and moderate a discussion and advocate, with advocates and experts who are working to address the complex set of challenges faced by rural Montanans daily. And finally, the panel discussion, uh, finally following the panel discussion, there will be an opportunity for audience members to make a public comment or share their experiences with us. And we very much look forward, look forward to hearing those comments. Today's event is being recorded and live streamed at consumerfinance.gov, and you can also follow CFPB on Facebook and Twitter. So let's get started. Senator Tester is unfortunately unable to be here with us today. However, he has prepared remarks that will be read by his field representative, Rio Agar Chively. Rio? Good morning. Hello, and thank you for inviting me to share a few words with you today. It's great to see Director Chopra getting out to Great Falls and hearing from Montanans about the issues they're facing here. I was proud to vote for Director Chopra's confirmation to head up CFPB last year after he got done as a Federal Trade Commissioner. His efforts to hold law-breaking companies accountable through vigorous agency enforcement and his commitment to creating a fair and functional marketplace for companies and consumers alike make him a standout choice for director of CFPB. He hasn't lost sight of these goals in his new role, pushing to make sure that the public service loan forgiveness program is working for folks who have been serving their communities for a decade enforcing consumer financial protection laws. As director, Chopra has also held up a commitment he made to me during his nomination to meet directly with folks in Montana that the Bureau oversees and those he's meant to protect. An open and collaborative dialogue enhances CFPB's goals, and today's event will build on the work Director Chopra has started in his first months as director. I look forward to continuing to work with CFPB to fight against bad actors and big corporations taking advantage of consumers. Thanks again to Director Chopra for making the trip out to Montana and for hosting this town hall today. I'm sure it will be a great conversation, and I think you'll learn a lot. Thank you, and sincerely, United States Senator John Tester. Thank you, Rio. Please extend our gratitude and our well wishes to the Senator. I am now pleased to introduce Commissioner Melanie Hall. Commissioner Hall has served as Commissioner of the Montana Division of Banking and Financial Institutions since January 2011. As Commissioner, she provides overall leadership to the Banking Division, which is responsible for the supervision of all state-chartered banks and state-chartered credit unions in Montana. 
Additionally, the division licenses and examines more than 500 non-bank financial institution, in, entities, including mortgage lenders, servicers and bankers, consumer loan companies, sales finance companies, among other financial products. The division is also responsible for processing consumer complaints from Montanans against regulated and unregulated providers of financial services. Commissioner Hall is also the immediate past chair of the, con of the con Conference of State Bank Supervi Supervisors Board of Directors. The CFPB is grateful for Commissioner Hall's thought leadership on issues affecting state banking and financial entities, markets, and in particular, the issues and challenges unique in banking and financial markets in rural communities. Commissioner Hall. Thank you and good morning everyone. It's nice to see some um, very familiar faces out in the audience today, including Senator um, Tom Jacobson from Great Falls. Um, and additionally, um, a number of our, our bankers and credit union representatives from around the state. The division is part of, uh, I'm a state employee, um, and we are part of um, the Department of administration within the state. But what our office does, as Karen just mentioned, is regulate banks, credit unions, mortgage companies, consumer finance companies that operate and impact Montana citizens. And the biggest responsibility that I believe our office has is to coordinate with our federal counterparts and to represent the way that things work here in Montana and how that might be a little different than they work in other states um, and other parts of the country. So I wanted to just do two things. One, um, let you know, I think sometimes our office isn't the most known thing in state government, but we are always there to help you and the people that you are assisting if you have any um, financial challenges, whether that's you have um, people that you work with who um, their mortgage servicer has changed or they are having trouble making their mortgage payments and they need help with a refinance, you can always contact our office and we are happy to uh, help facilitate those discussions. Additionally, I truly want to thank Director, Director Chopra for coming out here. We all know, those of us in Montana, I'll never forget, um, at a rural um, dynamics conference probably 10 years ago, someone flew out from Treasury and they said, you know, I had to take two flights to get here, but it was totally worth it. And I thought, this person has no clue what it's like to live in rural Montana, where we take at least two flights to get anywhere. Um, and we're just thrilled when we don't have to take three. So um, I truly appreciate Director Chopra coming out and not just flying in, having this moment, and flying out, but um, he came in yesterday, spent time walking around in Belt and spending time in the community and really understanding what rural Montana is. I moved here, I grew up in Mississippi, and so Mississippi is not like, you know, known for its very um, urban um, dynamics, but I thought I knew what rural was, and then I moved to Montana, and it has been an eye-opening experience to see the true challenges of people who live in places that don't have access to what a lot of people in this country take for granted every day in terms of services. So thank you so much, Director Chopra, for being out here with us um, in Montana, and welcome, welcome from the great state of Montana. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hall. I'm now pleased to introduce CFPB's director, Rohit Chopra. Director Chopra was sworn in as director of the CFPB by President Biden on October 12, 2021, where he has began, begun tackling the country's most pressing consumer financial challenges, including, of course, the important issues we are here to discuss today. The director previously served at the CFPB from 2010 to 2015, and in 2011, the Secretary of the Treasury des designated him as the agency student loan ombudsman, where he led the Bureau's efforts on student loan issues. In, his, in between his stints at the Bureau, Director Chopra served as a commissioner on the, on the Federal Trade Commission, where he worked to strengthen sanctions against repeat offenders, to reverse the, CF, uh, the FTC's 
reliance on no money, no fault settlements and fraud cases, and to halt abuses of small businesses. Without further ado, Director Chopra. Well, thanks everyone for being here. I especially want to thank everyone who's um, dealing with friends or family affected by the flooding that's been going on, and um, I know uh, it's high on many of your minds. I want to also make sure I, I acknowledge um, many of the folks who really helped put this event together, also Commissioner Hall, one of, one of our favorite banking commissioners in America, who I think 11 years now um, has been serving the state. So really, again, looking forward to today's event. I first also want to make sure we uh, thank everyone at Great Falls College MSU for hosting us. And um, today, we're really here to talk about relationship banking, particularly in rural communities. And my remarks today reflect my own views and don't necessarily represent the views of any other part of the Federal Reserve System. But all of us are thinking about what's happening in rural communities right now. Um, the data is not so great. And until we really do and take some action, it's not going to change. In 1984, the United States had nearly 18,000 banking institutions. And last year, that number declined to under 5,000. What was once a consumer finance marketplace that was dynamic and primarily populated by local financial institutions and credit unions is now dominated by larger banks that have taken over many of those small players. Banking has changed significantly, and today we essentially have a couple of different business models, and let me run through some of them. First, while there are no established definitions, relationship banking is a model used to serve families, businesses, and communities as individuals with an emphasis on providing customized help rather than assembly line style service. At this point in the United States, relationship banking is geared more toward high net worth individuals who typically enjoy a wide range of banking services, often through local, regional, and national private wealth managers. For most households and small businesses, this kind of relationship banking is becoming harder to find. Then there's transactional banking, which relies on highly standardized or mechanized products and processes. And typically, transactional banking is governed by terms and regulations imposed by the financial company on the consumer without any flexibility or negotiation. And when a customer has a problem, they typically can't go to the individual that originally signed them up for the product. This type of banking typically involves significant scale. In other words, big operations with lots of customers. And many of the big banks that took over the smaller banks in the past several decades have moved to this model. And third, more recently, many financial institutions are shifting to what I call algorithmic banking, which relies on using vast quantities of data about an individual through tracking and surveillance to make predictions about their behavior and banking habits. Advanced computational models make determinations about what products will be offered to you and whether you will be approved. I expect that we will see more and more of this type of banking as big tech conglomerates enter financial services. This new banking landscape has completely changed the way we save our money, apply for credit, and live our financial lives. It has presented challenges for many, but it has been particularly hard on rural America, and Montana is no exception. Bank consolidation and new banking models happened at the same time that many smaller banks uh, were not able to serve rural America, or when many big banks sometimes closed branches. When farmers and ranchers started to capture smaller and smaller shares of the food dollar, Family farmers started to scrape for every penny, and many populations started to decline. The big banks saw less of an incentive to have a brick-and-mortar presence in small towns. 
And when these banks shuttered, in some cases, nothing replaced them. Instead, we see banking deserts where communities lack access to in-person banking facilities. There are large swaths of areas with no bank branches all over the United States because of some of these consolidations and retreats. And in fact, 60% of existing bank, banking deserts and 81% of potential banking deserts are located in rural areas. From Alaska to Appalachia to family farms and ranches here, there's a wide range of diverse pe people, economies, and ways of life when we talk about rural America. But there are common threads, and one of them is that Americans who live in rural areas tend to rely, in terms of their economic life, on the local bank, much more so than the rest of the country. This is partly because rural economies and rural businesses require specialized expertise to meet their credit needs. When taking out a loan to buy parcels of land, it helps to have a banker who understands local zoning. Rural banking is also different than in other areas because the agricultural economy is different. For example, the financial health of farmers and ranchers and others depends on unpredictable precipitation and sometimes extreme weather, not to mention volatile commodity prices that can upend expectations. And when local banks pack up and leave town, and when issues are instead funneled through national call centers or through algorithms, there's less of a local on-the-ground knowledge that is the basis of good customer service and, frankly, good banking. Depository institutions that operate the transactional banking model, largely through mobile and digital platforms, have tried to fill some of the banking desert gap. And indeed, big banks have invested in creating scalable, more digital-centric banking, and people can bank at all times of the night. Sometimes loan approvals can be done in seconds, and virtual assistants can have sometimes replaced human bank tellers. But these business models that privilege automation at the expense of high-quality human interactions don't always deliver the best outcomes for consumers and communities, nor do they always fix the problems from the past. For example, while we know that human discretion without appropriate guardrails presents a danger of discrimination, automated systems present their own dangers too, as algorithmic bias can unfairly shut out customers from the credit they need. The CFPB's own examinations have found that customers report a struggle to obtain basic information when humans are replaced by call center menus and algorithms, or when companies try to cut corners by slashing customer service costs. Struggles include that it can take too long to get problems solved, that customers have to repeat information to multiple people transferred from one call center agent to the next to the next, and that employees may not even be knowledgeable about their situation or have never even really heard of the issue before. Other studies have shown that customers report being more satisfied with an outcome to a complex problem, such as disputing a fee or taking out a loan, when they interact with a person rather than a machine. Good customer service means supporting customers and providing knowledge and resources. Rural communities, like all communities, know this too well because of their unique banking needs. They deserve to be able to bank like they want to with customer service that understands the situation and can customize to their needs. We should all be able to ask basic questions about our accounts and actually get clear answers. It's reasonable to expect shorter wait times and informed customer service personnel who can solve problems, again, without bouncing a customer from department to department to department. Relationship banking does not usually involve signing up people for fake accounts. What real relationship banking does is respond to customers with clear answers, and that can translate into what's best for the entire community. And when banks put effort into service, responsiveness, and customer care, problems get solved and customers get the products that best match their needs. At the CFPB and at federal banking agencies, we are taking a number of steps 
to help revitalize relationship banking, especially in rural communities. First, we will be looking to ensure that big banks are not simply sending people through call center mazes in order to get them to give up on asking for help with their account. A decade ago, after the financial crisis, Congress recognized the need for stronger customer service and responsiveness. In Section 1034 of the 2010 Consumer Financial Protection Act, lawmakers specified that consumers have rights to obtain timely responses to their questions about their accounts at banks with over $10 billion in assets. Today, we are launching an initiative to find out how people can assert these rights to better customer service with their bank or credit union. We want to hear from customers about their service experiences, and we want to know what information would be helpful for consumers to obtain from their banks more easily. We want to know what kinds of account information they're seeking and whether they're able to obtain it in a timely manner as the law specifies. And if not, what are the obstacles, and is this preventing them from achieving their banking goals? Second, federal banking regulators are taking a hard look at bank mergers, including the Bank Merger Act. Now, merging is a privilege, and applications are only supposed to be approved when the institution, when combined, can meet the needs and convenience of the community. We are looking at public comments now to determine how we might change the bank merger process. And yesterday, when I got a chance to meet with one of Montana's local banks, um, Belt Valley Bank, I actually heard more about how they're serving the community and what some of their customers said about what happened if they didn't exist. And for many bank mergers, that sometimes eliminates a local bank that's a part of the fabric of the community. The regulators are also taking a hard look at the Community Reinvestment Act. And one of my priorities is to ensure that any of those changes really help rural customers and not put them more, farther behind. Third, the CFPB is working to ensure that algorithmic banking is not being given special treatment and must follow the same set of rules that relationship banks follow. Last month, the CFPB published a policy affirming that companies must explain to applicants the specific reasons for denying an application for credit or taking other adverse actions, and they can't simply use the fact that they use a black box algorithm that they can't make sense of in order to avoid complying with the law. We are also requiring the big tech companies like Google, Facebook, and Apple to tell us what are they doing when it comes to their payment systems and how they're collecting data to feed their algorithms. We will be making sure that technology is really helping people and businesses and not just creating more surveillance. In the end, the CFPB wants institutions of all sizes to foster an inclusive relationship banking model that meets consumers' expectations of service. It's not too high of a bar to set for people to be able to ask basic questions about their accounts and to get a response in a timely manner like many local relationship banks do today. So I'm really glad to be here today, and I again want to thank everyone who was part of putting this event together and I'm looking forward uh, to our panel discussion and participation to come. Thank you. Thank you, Director Chopra. So now we will transition to our panel discussion which will be moderated by our very own Director Chopra. So at this time, I'd like to invite the panelists to take the stage. Uh, while they are doing so, I'll briefly introduce them, starting with uh, Bruce Hoyer, who serves as the CEO of Belt Valley Bank, a locally owned, full-service 
Independent Bank serving Central Montana since 1936. Welcome, Bruce. Next, we have Dustin Bergstrom, who is the owner and founder of Dusty's Sprinklers, a Great Falls-based small business started in 1989. Our next panelist is Beth Hayes, a, co a consumer law attorney at the Montana Legal Services Association, a private nonprofit law firm that provides non-criminal legal information, advice, and representation to thousands of Montanans each year. Our fourth panelist is Tanya Plummer, who is the executive director of the Montana Native Growth Fund, a Native American community development financial institution based in the Fort Belknap Indian Reservation in Montana. And finally, we have Greg Harper, who is a financial capabilities counselor with Rural Dynamics, a Great Falls-based financial nonprofit helping thousands of clients achieve financial security. I want to take, take a moment to thank Rural Dynamics for con connecting us with the members of the community to ensure today's event was a success. Welcome to all the panelists. I turn it over to you, Director Chopra. How about now? Yes. Okay. Great. We have to hold it, just so you know. So I want to thank all of the panelists for joining. And um, I thought maybe I'd just start by really hearing from each of you briefly um, just a tiny bit more about why you're here um, and what you care about and what you really think needs to change in what's happening in our financial industry and, and for consumers today. I'll start with you, Greg. Well, good morning. Um, I've had the pleasure uh, to be working with Rural Dynamics for the past 16 years in many capacities. Um, I have been a reverse mortgage counselor, a bankruptcy counselor, a housing counselor, and my current lines of business, I'm a certified housing counselor, credit counselor. I've been providing the credit portion of the first time home buyers class uh, every month on and off for the last 16 years. And I think uh, one, one of the strengths that I see in, in Montana is our ability to develop and maintain strong relationships with service providers. And uh, we need those, uh, those collaborations. And uh, I think we really benefit from that. Uh, I recently had spent about three years with our national affiliate Green Path, so I got to uh, in my capacity as a housing counselor, uh, really look at the national picture from New York, Florida, uh, California, Texas, and then most recently coming back to Montana to serve Montana folks. Uh, but really excited to be here and engage in this conversation and really look forward to seeing how we can improve rural communities. Thank you, Greg. Director, I jumped the gun a little bit. I was going to uh, help uh, with the remarks and move things along. So I believe uh, Bruce was going to be next and then Dustin. Uh, good morning. My name is Bruce Hoyer. I'm the CEO of Bell Valley Bank and Belt. Um, I've been at the bank for 38 years. I've obviously seen a lot of changes to the financial industry in that time. I had a wonderfully crafted speech here ready to give you and I'm just going to wing it instead because based on opening remarks and uh, discussion. But first off, I'd like to thank the director for choosing Montana for one of the listening sessions. Um, and thanks for having me on this panel. Um, our bank's one of the smallest banks in the state of Montana. We're about 80 million, which to me is a lot to banks. It's not much, but um, we were very happy to host you yesterday in our town. Um, I would like to thank you too for the work you've done so far to try and fix the appraisal process. Um, as many of you know, if you've tried to buy a house or anything, appraisals are, are very difficult in Montana with our lack of appraisers. Um, state of Montana, 10 years ago, had 64 state chartered banks. Today, there's 37. Um, as the director mentioned, uh, banks are getting <coughs> uh, merged, bought out, et cetera, by the larger banks. And I, being a small bank, I'm not here to trash on the big banks because I think every, every bank has a purpose. 
the bigger banks can do a lot of things that the small banks can't because of lending limits and money available and stuff. But I also think the reason for a lot of the mergers is the increased regulations being handed down, not just from the CFBB, but by all agencies, including the state. <laughs> and they pass down these regulations that we have to comply with. Well, with a small bank of, with 12 employees, you know, and several thousand customers, there's only so many hours in a day we can uh, address these issues. Um, I think a lot of the small banks that I've known through the years, they just finally throw in the towel because you can't keep up with all the regulations and serve the customer. My dad was in the bank ahead of me. He, his favorite thing was if you take care of the customer, the bottom line takes care of itself. And that worked 50 years ago. It doesn't work anymore because we have to take care of the customer and all the regulatory requirements in order to stay in business and stay viable. Um, I, I think I, some kind of change has to happen with the sizing of the regulations and how they're enforced on what sizes of institutions. Um, that's the only thing that's going to allow the smaller banks to be able to stay in business. You know, at our bank, we go to work every day to take care of our customers. That, that's our goal. And it's getting harder, but we want to continue that because we like helping the community and being there for the community. So, again, I do appreciate you coming to Montana, and thanks for the opportunity to, uh, for us to speak and, and for you to listen. Um, Montana, like Melanie said, it's its own thing. It's, you know, uh, I've never lived anywhere else, so I'm no expert. I don't want to live anywhere else, but I'm happy here. But in talking to people, it's Montana's just its own thing, and we're proud of it. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Dustin. Next, Dustin, yes. Hello. Um, first, let me thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be part of today's event. A uh, quick bit of history about me. I grew up in a small town east of here called Highwood. Um, Highwood's a town of under 200 people with a school, a bar, couple churches and a post office, but certainly no banks. Um, I'm currently the owner and operator of Dusty Sprinklers. Uh, Dusty's is an irrigation and landscape company that serves Great Falls and surrounding communities up to a hundred mile radius. Um, my banking experience started early at age seven when my father opened a checking and savings account for me at Bell Valley Bank. And at age 15, he secured a loan for equipment to help start Dusty Sprinklers. Unbeknown to me at the time was that I had already been introduced to what I, we call relationship banking. See, my father banked at Bell Valley Bank with Jerry Hoyer, Bruce Hoyer's father. Uh, today I'd like to share with you uh, what relationship banking has meant to me and my company. I know that the type of relationship that I have had has had a profound effect on my business, not because of the products they offer or the interest rates, but rather the comfort and trust I have in banking with them. This type of comfortable relationship has certainly been a part of why I've continued banking at Bell Valley Bank. In the past, I have often wondered what it would look like if Belt Valley Bank was no longer. Uh, this thought actually pushed me to seek other options uh, with larger banks. Uh, my experience with the larger banks was by no means bad, it just wasn't the same. There wasn't the same feeling of the importance of the relationship. I decided then that I would continue to do all of my commercial banking with Belt Valley Bank. And today, as my company has grown and prospered, I believe it was the right decision. It is my hope that other small businesses are able to experience the same kind of beneficial relationship that I have, to be able to create a lifelong partnership through relationship banking. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dustin. Go ahead, Beth. Hello, folks. Uh, my name is Beth Hayes, and I am a staff attorney with our consumer practice group at Montana Legal Services Association, or MLSA. Um, as Karen had mentioned, we are a statewide uh, nonprofit law firm. So we represent folks in civil matters who are at or below a certain um, income level. 
um, essentially 125% of the federal poverty guideline. So the perspective that I bring today is for folks who, who are living in poverty and facing some challenges unique to that situation. Um, I represent consumers in a wide range of issues, uh, primarily debt collection issues, and uh, the perspective I offer today is that a lot of my clients are unbanked. They don't have a bank account, whether there is a bank or a credit union locally or not. Um, well, the primary reason for that for most of my clients is that they are facing um, some pretty aggressive debt collection activity uh, in levies on their bank accounts. And so even if they have uh, you know, income or other money in the account that might be protected through our state exemption laws, the procedure that they have to follow that is such that they, the money gets taken and then there's a procedure for them to get it back. And there's also a fee every time that happens um, in nearly every bank or credit union account um, agreement that I've reviewed. And so the reality for those folks who are living paycheck to paycheck or living on fixed incomes is such that having a bank account of any sort is a risk to them that might mean the difference between making a car payment or making their rent. So a lot of the clients that I assist have um, taken or closed bank accounts and are operating completely unbanked. Um, the alternative product that they often will turn to is some type of um, payroll card prepaid account. And of course, those products are, not, are also not 100% safe from being levied, although they are far less likely to be levied. And so they offer some safety and protection in that way for folks who need that um, ability to preserve their limited funds and pay their um, basic necessities. But they also, of course, have a lot of other fees and um, you know, high costs associated with them. So I guess I just bring the perspective that it's often pretty expensive to be poor in America. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I do certainly have a lot of clients who appreciate you know, kind of having the local bank that they can go to. Um, you know, in, in my world of federal funding for legal services, I think all of Montana, except for Billings, is technically considered rural. But I'm, I operate out of the, um, the large city of Missoula. But um, I represent folks throughout the state of Montana. So a lot of the clients that I'm talking to um, just aren't necessarily doing any type of banking anymore because of the, the risk that they face to their, their limited, um, limited funds. And just thanks for um, including us in the conversation, as a lot of times folks um, living in that sort of uh, lower income threshold are sort of uh, omitted. So we appreciate CFPB in including us today. Thank you. Thank you. And Tanya, last but not least. Thank you. It's very good to be here, and I thank you for uh, inviting us to be here. Thank you to Director Chopra for coming to Montana. It's good to see you again. Uh, direct Montana Native Growth Fund. We are a native CDFI based on the Fort Belknap Indian Reservation. I am a Montana native in every sense of the word. I was born in Glasgow, Montana. I'm an enrolled tribal member of Assiniboine, Sioux, and Cree heritage. Um, you asked us to share what we care about. I care about what happens socioeconomically to individuals. It's hard to think of folks that we work with as consumers, but consumers, but also entire people groups when there is an extreme lack of access to, to capital, to services, to education. Um, and that's very uh, much what's happened to our Indian people in Montana. Uh, and I care about that people group very, very much. Uh, we're a, a core part of what makes up Montana uh, with 12 federally recognized tribes, seven Indian reservations, and our newly federally recognized Little Shell who are landless. Uh, many of our folks live in nearby uh, urban communities because there's no place to live on the reservation. Um, the impetus for our creation, where our younger organization, uh, was to help us figure out a mechanism for home ownership in Indian country. The bulk of my career has been in mortgage banking, um, and so I've seen uh, how mortgage banks and larger banks operate and function. Um, in terms of relationship with the CFPB, when TRIT hit the scene in 2015, my job was to read the rule and figure out how to make it work for a large mortgage banker that sorked in 17 states and 70 branch offices. Um, and so I've appreciated the, um, the concern of the Bureau and understood the balance that's necessary in regulation and relationship. Um, so coming from, from this perspective, now I guess um, 
a word that keeps coming to the forefront of my mind is balance. When we work with our clients, with our people that we love so much as a relationship-based lender, we really are looking for balance. We work with people holistically and care so much more, not, not just the transaction or what their immediate need is, uh, but a lot of times we're the first person who's allowed them to dream about what they wanted to be and what they need and where they could go and how that could serve their community. And so we care about their role in, in our community and how that builds our tribal economy. And we really take that holistic, and then that's a model that doesn't necessarily fit all of the banks and the larger institutions, the credit unions. We have very few uh, brick and mortar institutions where the relationship like that is allowed or, or even possible. Um, and I'm cautious in that front because uh, I, I certainly don't want to, you know, uh, be negative towards the larger banking institutions either. I'm looking in the audience at some of the banks that we want and need to have relationship with. I'm looking at face of credit unions and leaders who we want and need to have relationship. Uh, I think many of us do care about our communities, um, but I think some things have gone rogue and uh, the opportunity for us to build the right relationship is no longer there. Um, I'm speaking specifically of Community Reinvestment Act and uh, how weak that has been and how much stronger it needs to be, how much more specific that language needs to be to drive real investment, not just in-kind token investment into our communities and more specifically to our native communities in Montana through our CDFIs. Um, I could talk forever about this. I love this work, but I'll let it let, let you go. No, no, that's great. And actually, uh, I wanted to start by asking the panel a little bit about housing prices and land prices um, and how that's impacting things here in Montana. So I wonder if um, anyone wanted to share their own perspective on what are the challenges that first-time homeowners are facing or, or older homeowners or whoever you've been thinking about in terms of um, getting a mortgage. I don't know, Greg, if I can start with you. Uh, well, the current environment obviously is challenging with increased rates and, and so forth. And what I see with folks uh, when we do the first-time home buyers class and I, and I facilitate the credit portion is that generally that's the first time that folks are, um, are really engaging with the relationship banking. Other than that, they really haven't really thought about that relationship, which kind of surprises me. And, um, but it seems to me at that level is where uh, folks kind of start to engage in that, the understanding of that, needing that uh, relationship with, one-on-one uh, -on -one relationship with the financial institution to help kind of walk them through that process. But we're certainly seeing uh, challenges right now uh, in terms of the population that we service, the, the low income, low to moderate income. I mean, it, it's home ownership is really kind of, you know, out of, out of, not in their grasp. Let's put it that way. Um, I think what we're seeing a lot of is the increased prices. Um, and back to your question about like first time home buyers and stuff, very difficult right now. Um, just, because of the market and where the market's going. Um, you know, you have people coming into the state paying twenty, thirty, a hundred thousand dollars over asking price for homes. Um, it makes it tough if you're a first time home buyer to have that, you know, to compete against cash offers. And I think in a lot of this area anyways, we're seeing cash offers, not seeing the financing, so the interest increased in interest rates and stuff don't really play an effect on it. Um, you know, you have the uh, buyers coming in that have sold their house for probably way more than it's worth, and they're coming in willing to pay way more than houses are worth here. And I think it's, uh, especially if you get west of the mountains in, in Montana, we had a board meeting the other day, and we were just talking with our board, and I said, how's it going to be in Bozeman when, the average house is 700 and some thousand, I believe. So people come in, uh, tech jobs, high paying job stuff, they can buy a house. Who's gonna be there to run the restaurant and the hotels and the service stations and the grocery stores?
because all those people can't afford to live there. So they're currently, they start out moving to Belgrade and then Manhattan, and now I've heard they're traveling, you know, Three Forks, Butte, they're traveling to work. Well, at what point is all this, there's going to be a whole bunch of houses there with no services provided for them. It's kind of a spooky situation, I think. Beth, what about um, individuals you work with in terms of not just home ownership, but challenges with rental housing and affordability? Yeah, um, that's certainly the, the first thing that came to mind. A lot of our clients are, are probably not necessarily able to be homeowners even before prices got as crazy as they are now. Um, but I mean, obviously that the cost of housing has, has been passed down, um, to renters. And I mean, I think we're in a full on crisis in Montana, at least in, um, you know, certainly in sort of the, the flathead Missoula, Bozeman, but we're seeing it even in, in outlying communities as well that, um, with, without any, you know, limits on the, you know, percent of rent increase allowed, we're seeing folks who are, you know, have been living in rentals for many years you know, making Montana wages uh, and are, are facing, you know, 100% or more increases in their rent and have no nowhere else to go. And, uh, you know, people, you know, there's vacancy rates less than 1%, at least in Missoula right now. And so, um, you know, thankfully, there's some ability to try to keep folks housed with some of the, you know, COVID-related rental assistance money. But even at some point, there's just, you know, our clients are, are, have nowhere else to go. Um, another sort of population I wanted to sort of echo that we're seeing more and more problems with in Montana is um, elderly folks who are trying to kind of age in place within their home. So they maybe aren't dealing with a mortgage payment any longer and trying to keep up with that, but the increase in property taxes is becoming unsustainable for a lot of Montanans in their ability to uh, maintain housing and um, Older folks are facing property tax lien sales in a way that is is getting to be more and more of a problem. And um, other options for those folks, if they're wanting to downsize, just aren't available in a lot of Montana communities because the cost of rent is astronomically higher than you know what they're dealing with there. So um, I, I I don't know what's going to happen, but uh, you know I certainly couldn't purchase a house where I live now if I hadn't done it five years ago. It would be priced out of the market for sure, and I probably would be forced to leave the community that I live in because I also couldn't afford the rent, which is now more than my mortgage um, from a lot of folks that are that I know living in, in the Missoula community. Yeah, I'd like to add to that. Um, I am a proxy uh, for the state of Montana helping with uh, to facilitate the MIRA program. And what we're seeing ac across the state is that landlords that may have been under market before are in increasingly raising those rents um, to the threshold where folks just can't afford that. I mean, it is well over their you know, 30 thirty percent of their income, and especially that population with the fixed income. Uh, those folks have nowhere to go, and there there literally no inventory out there for ownership or even rental and the funds uh the mira funds are wonderful uh, but what i'm seeing as beth mentioned is that it, it's th those funds are going to come to an end and then what are those folks going to do tanya you mentioned the community reinvestment act um, uh, as i mentioned earlier that there's some proposals to overhaul it that we've put out for public comment and I wanted to invite you to share some more specifics about what you'd like to see in a final outcome. Thank you. Uh, I think I serve as the Rocky Mountain delegate for the Native CDFI network on their policy committee and so that group of folks has been going through the red line of the proposed changes and trying to figure out what, what, what do we like, what do we not like. Um, and, and it still feels very weak. Um, and so there's a lot of language about they, they may, they could, they should, um, but there's very little to truly incentivize that the right types of investments to go to the right places. Um, and so I think there, there definitely needs to be some more specifics. I appreciate the addition of um, the definition of Indian land areas. Um, and, and that type of investment, but I do think it could be even more specific about how to make things happen in Indian land areas because then 
you're dealing with sovereign nations who each have their own regulations. And so I can't say enough how highly I would recommend that there be investment in CDFIs and specifically native CDFIs and Indian land areas. The reason for that is we're those ones that have the relationships on the ground. We understand the policies, the zoning you mentioned earlier, um, the SEDs in that area, the, the, the tribal SEDs, um, and, and ways to make development happen in the right way. In addition, we're the educators. And so on the ground, walking our clients through the process of, of getting things done, whether that's starting a business or having a home ownership plan, whatever it is, um, the banks are just, they're simply not, it does not fit their model and they're not able to do that, larger banks. I think there are some good community banks who can and, and, and do a good job, but. Uh, so I would just say more specific language uh, about that type of investment. I, I talked with some other executive directors and I don't know if there can be uh, like a point system or something that can more specifically incentivize the right types of investment. So, you know, you're graded on how you meet your CRA. It, right now it's way too easy to just check a box. It's way too easy to work with a non-community based, non-native CDFI who has a product that might work in that community and never actually does. And we have that in Montana, you know. Um, and so I want the ability as a director to, to go to those banks and say, let me help you meet your CRA obligation. Let's do this project. You know, at Fort Belknap, we have two uh, competitive Indian housing block grants that have been awarded to us through HUD. Our tribal enterprise has stepped up with leverage funds and our tribal council has prioritized 160 acres for residential development. And we're leaning hard into Fannie Mae and into USDA and some of the federal agencies because there's no products available to us with the banks. We have to defer to federally insured or guaranteed products. And frankly, back to the housing discussion, feeling redlined in that area because they're just not available. So I need leverage and a way to go to that bank and say, let me help you, let's build this relationship, put the money here, this is what we can do with it. It's a win for everyone. Uh, but it's just not there in the language yet. Can I just switch gears? Um, Dustin, I'll ask you maybe to build a little bit on what you shared earlier about how do you and other business owners make decisions about who to bank with, um, especially when choosing between something more local or, or more of a larger national chain? Um, I, I guess to me, just back to the comfort thing, knowing, getting, knowing what you're walking into, um, understanding that they know who you are, what your needs are, and how to serve you. Uh, and like I said, not that larger banks can't do that. It's just been my experience that in the smaller situation, that conversation really hardly had to happen because they know where I come from and, and what challenges we face as small businesses. You think about they know what the travel looks like and, you know, the equipment resources. You know, we don't have a lot of equipment dealers in these areas. Um, so that's always something that we, we, we deal with and, and even, even the resource of, of, of staffing. Um, and most of these small banks probably get that idea as well. Um, it's not easy to compete with a lot of the larger businesses or I imagine the same with the banking. And Bruce, um, I, want, I hope you can share with everyone something you shared with me about you know, your concern about um, reporting data that might re-identify some of your clients, especially in a small community or neighborhood. Um, I hope it's okay if you share with everyone that. Yeah. Um, like we talked yesterday, there's a section 1071 of the Dodd-Frank Act that the CFPB is, is working on now to issue, issue final rules, I believe, but it creates data points and I, I would, off the top of my head, I think there was 13 data points that Congress required and CFPB's added eight more. So a total of 21 data points that the banks would have to cl collect and report on every small business, small farm, et cetera, that they do a loan for. Well, in our case, um, uh, and what we discussed yesterday is, 
in the small town of Bell, everybody knows who owns the one grocery store and the three bars and the bowling alley and, you know, the parts store. And a lot of this data that's being collected, um, if you sit down and look at the data, you can figure out who wanted the loan, even though the reg says they'll redact names and, and addresses and stuff. Well, if there's any mention of a sprinkler service in the, in the report, everybody's saying, oh, well, Dustin's in getting another loan, you know? So I, it's very, there again, you're back to Montana, small communities, everybody knows everybody, and that's very hard. About all you could redact so nobody can figure it out is everything. And, and Beth, I wonder if you could share a little bit more about what you said earlier about some people, um, you know, aren't in the banking system or have been pushed out of it. And, you know, from your perspective, what are some of the reasons for that? I mean, I certainly don't have data, but anecdotally, um, I mean, I've been talking to consumers, low-income consumers in Montana, um, you know, 10 or so a week, sometimes more, sometimes less, for the last five or six years. And most of the scenario that I see for folks who are unbanked, they were banked once before, right? And they just, um, you know, had their bank account levied by a creditor and just can't take that risk any longer. Because if, if, if the money is taken, if they are entitled to some portion of it back under our state's exemption laws, it's going to be a while before they get it, even with the expedited process that Montana Code uh, provides for that procedure. And so the just, they don't have any excess funds to cover their rent, to cover their car payment, to cover their gas or electric bill. And so the reality is they either need to, you know, we also see folks who are choosing to have their paycheck deposited into, you know, their spouse's account that doesn't have their name on it or, you know, opting for the payroll card that their employer might provide. But when a fee gets charged for that payroll card, there's nobody they can talk to in Montana about that. They can't walk down the street. They can't do anything. But I can't blame them for, for figuring out how they're going to stay housed and pay their rent or keep their, you know, car in their possession when the, the reality is that if they, if they leave their money in a checking account, they just have risk that, um, you know, that just they can't take. And so I think a lot of my clients are, are you know, not choosing between the, the big bank or the local bank. They're choosing to stay housed. They're choosing to be able to stay current on a car payment. They're choosing to be able to afford their medication, um, all of those things. And so, uh, you know, c crippling consumer debt is the simple answer, I guess, to what's causing it. Um, you know, and we see folks who are, you know, originally got sent to collections for, you know, a $500 um, medical bill that by the time they were sued for it, the judgment is for $1,200. And their inability to pay that judgment over a number of years increases the balance with interest and fees to the point where, you know, seven, eight, nine years later, they're, they're facing almost a $5,000 debt. And there's just no way out of that, and they can't take that risk of, of keeping the limited funds they have in a traditional bank account. Um, so, the, I mean, I think just the, the massive amount of other consumer debt that they are facing is what's forcing them out of the traditional banking system. Yeah, and again, I'd like to piggyback off that again. Um, I think that people are, for the most part, reactionary. They're, they're not able to be proactive, and they just live in cycles. I, I remember pre-2010, uh, Roll Dynamics was part of a collaborative effort to purge the state of payday lenders, title lenders. I would say that the most of the folks that I talked to back then didn't know they were disadvantaged. They were just in the moment. You know, they were working with what they needed and to, to just get by and to focus on housing, medicine. And, and we're still in that cycle now, although we don't have that issue anymore. I think it's still 
Um, I work with Beth closely in Montana Legal Services with just really working with folks to not only validate kind of where they're at, but really, as I think as Tanya mentioned, uh, take a holistic approach and really work with them to empower them, you know, to say, hey, we're, we're going to be advocates for you and we're going to add on to that team different components, whether that's the financial component through a community bank or credit union, those, you know, we're going to do that together. So I think part of it and what my, our approach really, or my approach is that, you know, really just to validate where folks are and, and not enable them, but really work them through that process and build, uh, build on, you know, small steps. And right now, lots of, lots of folks are facing plenty of challenges out there. I wonder, Bruce, if I can ask you to talk a little bit about, um, you know, some of your clients and customers who are in farming and ranching. What are some of the challenges they're dealing with um, from weather to commodity prices? And, and what are you hearing? Uh, so much of the farming and ranching industry is... Um, there, there's so many factors that uh, the farmer rancher has no choice about. You know, they don't know if it's, they can't make it rain. You know, they can't control the wind or hail storms or anything. It's just mother nature and they, they have to learn to deal with that. Um, hopefully they have enough land equity that they can borrow against to get them through times like that if they need to. But the other challenges right now are the cost of, uh, input costs. You know, where it used to be uh, several years ago to seed an acre of winter wheat cost you 120-ish dollars to seed for your input costs. Right now it's costing you 220 230 dollars per acre to seed. Um, and they're putting all this money in the ground not knowing if we're going to get rain or if they're actually going to receive any income this fall. There is insurance products, federal crop insurance and stuff, but it only, it basically insures their inputs. If you try and insure for profit, you're, you're going to lose even more money. So I think with the cost right now of uh, their input costs, equipment, repairs, repairs are through the rough. You know, there's some guys waiting for parts for a swather for two, three, four, five, six months. Well... You can't wait that long to keep your swather running, you know, or your tractor. So it's definitely a trying time. I don't have any specific answers other than I believe, you know, all the banks I've talked with, everybody's just got to work with the customer and try and get them through. And hopefully the charts change again and they get back to making some money and pay back what they lost during the downtime. So, Tanya, yeah. Thank you. I needed to just jump in there, too, because you mentioned hopefully they have enough land equity to help get them through, um, which helps in some cases. But in our tribal communities, there is no land equity. Uh, when the government made treaties with our people, we were placed on reservations, and that land was placed in trust with the federal government, and it cannot be collateralized. So we don't have that equity to come to the table with. And so what that does to our, you know, in most tribal communities, agribusiness is one of the number one economic drivers. And so if our folks start to go out of business, that really, really hurts. And so CDFIs are having to step up and create products that fill those gaps between what a consumer can't get because their bank wants 50% collateral on what they do have, and usually it's older swathers and balers and parts, and um, FSA isn't going to come to the table with everything that they need. So we create many operating capital notes and work with those producers on a business plan. So we just had a... Uh, you know, you mentioned the things you can't control, acts of God, drought and grasshoppers has been really big here. Um, and so just major hurt. Couldn't get hay. We had a trucker in our community that was bringing in hay to producers, so necessary, kept a lot of producers going, um, but had off seasons. And what do I do? How do I stay in business? And so we provided capital and a business plan to help him fill out those off seasons so he could run a reefer truck and stay in business, keep his family in business, and then stay in business for the rest of the community. So that becomes a product that's not just for him as a consumer, but for our entire community. Um, and we have to get creative about seeing what those needs are and figuring out a way to provide access to them and education with it to make it work. Um, it's another element of consumer need. 
I wonder if anyone, um, I'm sure many people have seen how high car prices are um, over, because of the chip shortage. Um, new cars are often selling for many thousands of dollars over MSRP. Used cars are more expensive. Of course, many people in certain rural areas drive longer distances. Um, they use their car more, fuel costs. I wonder what, um, I don't know, Beth or others want to share anything about how people are handling that in terms of auto lending, um, credit card lending, and, and how they're managing. Um, I guess I would share that folks are not managing all that well, um, which is probably not a surprise to anybody in the audience. But um, the, I mean, from, from where, you know, my, my clients are generally never really navigating a new car purchase. They're solely in the used car market. And they are, um, you know, I think, again, anecdotally, what I've seen in this sort of transition period into where we are now, it used to be every folk, every client I spoke with, it was like, you know, the creditor's never going to bother coming after your old used car. That is not as true as it once was. And so there's an increased risk that a lot of um, clients are facing in, um, in not so much a repossession from the lender, but a... Um, seizure of the vehicle from a separate judgment creditor, often related to medical debt. So um, that's like a different uh, reality that folks are facing. And even for the, a lot of the clients that I end up working with, I'm counseling ultimately probably to file a Chapter 7 bankruptcy as their only solution. And again, the car three years ago that they certainly would be able to keep under our um, state's uh, exemption protection for a motor vehicle is no longer going to be something that they can keep. So it's an, an added barrier to determining whether bankruptcy might be a good solution, even with the 2021 Montana legislature increasing the motor vehicle exemption in Montana up to 4000 from 2500 And even that $4,000 protection is no longer a, an option necessarily to be able to keep the vehicle. And a lot of the clients I deal with don't have the ability to buy out that equity in a Chapter 7 bankruptcy anyway. So the, the one solution that's sort of the last ditch effort, bankruptcy, is also no longer a reality for folks if they're looking at losing that vehicle. And what are they going to get into? There isn't anything else for them to purchase in this market. So it's, it's obviously affecting their ability to get into a car, but it's also changing their options for how to solve their ultimate financial challenges, too. Can I mention something, too, about the prices? One of the number one hindrances to qualifying for a home that we see is somebody who's been suckered by a car dealer. And so we're looking at their pre-qualification and their whole picture and their home ownership package and finding that for them to take out a mortgage loan, they have to have a number of disclosures that are regulated. They have to have three days to think about it before they engage in that. But in one Saturday afternoon, they can go in and take a look at something new and walk away with the equivalent of a house payment that allows them to, they can't do anything. And that's painful. Um, I'm not saying maybe more regulation, but, but that's hard to understand why you have to put so much thought and so much regulation into a home mortgage. But in literally hours, walk away with a $650 car payment plus insurance and not understand the gravity of that situation. So partly an education issue, but partly, you know, why is there so much regulation in one area and so much freedom in another that ultimately hurts a number of our consumers? Um, I wonder, Greg, if you can share a little bit um, of your organization's views on how did the state uh, change in terms of its lending environment after there was um, either a referendum or state law um, related to rate caps and other regulation of consumer credit? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, uh, 2010, that's a long time ago. Uh, what we noticed with that was that there was certainly, well, well, let, me, well let me digress a little bit. I have a different perspective. I worked with folks businesses that were the payday lenders and those folks they uh, that I visited with um, they felt they were filling a niche that they felt like they they were providing uh, a, a product where other people just uh, those folks just couldn't get it otherwise and although I validated that their perspective on it I think that the state um, post 
2010, I think it was a, a very big, 2011 is when it went into effect, but we just, we saw that we just, we saw a transition to other challenges. So it's not like the problem went away. It just, it, it, it kind of maybe morphed into a different set of challenges. Um, at that time, we did, I, w I, I saw a lot of uh, debt issue with folks that were really looking for um, opportunity to address their consumer debt, unsecured debt. And, and I, I can tell you now, in the last couple of years, um, not so much. I really, other than because maybe the, the focus and what I do as a proxy for the state or working with foreclosure mitigation, is that I'm seeing that the debt issue is not really where it was five or six years ago. And a couple of things that might be because of the pandemic and folks were able to pay some of that debt down. But then back to the car issue is that I'm seeing a lot of though that issue where folks are, you know, again, looking at being homeless and challenged with, with high car payments, but even if their cars are paid off, just the cost of trying to keep them running and maintaining them. So I don't know if that answered your question in terms of um, overall. I, I just, I, I think it, it was a positive in terms of moving forward. I just think that there, um, we now have a new set of challenges to face. I, I would also like to offer um, the perspective of that, the cap at the 36% that went into effect in Montana. I wasn't, at that point in time, I've been at Montana Legal Services for 13 years, but at that point in time, I was funded to do housing work, so I wasn't working as directly on consumer issues then as I am now. But the switch that we have seen is a product, I mean, the, the payday lenders, brick and mortar in Montana are gone, but they are now online, and they are from other states, and they are often operated by tribal entities. And we do still see people plenty of folks accessing those funds um, at that higher interest rate from other places. Um, certainly not at the scale that we saw prior to the 36% um, rate here in Montana, but there, those products are still out there for folks and we are seeing people get into quite a bit of trouble with those products still. Can I ask um, to Dustin and Bruce and others, what are some of the issues that your employees or members of their community are, are dealing with in terms of financial challenges? We mentioned housing costs. Um, I also wanted to ask, what is it like in terms of costs of providing health insurance and health care? And I know we're going to talk about medical bills, but anything that you want to share about that you hear from your own employees or their customers, others? Uh, I know from the bank's case, um, our health insurance costs, uh, just like everybody else, has gone up immensely over the course of, you know, uh, the last number of years. Uh, we were, while well, my dad helped start it with the State Bankers Trust, was a group of banks that basically had their own uh, health insurance uh, company that was underwritten by somewhere, you know, and it it basically just got to the point where the trust couldn't afford it anymore, so all the banks had to go out and find new policies. And of course, they were a lot more expensive and stuff, and I think what I see, we have good insurance for our employees and, and are able, thankfully, to do that for them, but I see a lot of businesses where uh, when it came about with, uh, Obamacare, you know, uh, reference in the national health insurance uh, products. A lot of our customers, commercial customers, just started offering their uh, employees money in lieu of insurance. You know, hey, your insurance would be 600 bucks a month. We'll give you $500 cash. You do what you want. While so many of those people did not go buy health insurance, they kept the money and you know, because they didn't want to spend the extra or thought they could get by, and it's turned around to cost them a lot of money. As far as employees and stuff, I think we're fairly lucky still in our area. Um, I know I, I have a full staff, and we don't have much turnover, so I'm not usually looking much, but in talk, I know some of our local bars and restaurants and the grocery store, 
they're struggling to find enough employees to stay open every day. You know, a number of the businesses through the winter would shut down one or two days a week, just they didn't have enough employees. Um, that makes it very difficult. Um, you know, when you can't, if you're not, if the doors aren't open, employees aren't making money, the business isn't making money, it's just a trickle down effect. I guess for us, um, in regards to our employees, you know, we definitely have seen what the increase in housing costs. Um, for example, we're currently trying to move into the Helen area and one of our foremen is with the budget that he has, it's almost impossible to secure anything. Um, we're trying to figure out how we can supplement that to get him there. Um, right now, uh, for the better part, we're putting him up in a hotel. So it's, it's, it's extremely expensive. Um, as far as health insurance, we don't currently provide a plan. Um, we actually at one time did through what was called Insure Montana. Um, I think, it, I believe it was um, funded off the cigarette tax. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly how that whole program went away, but it, it did work very well for us. Um, and it also seemed to scale the employees in a way that it didn't go from, you know, coverage to a, a full fall off cliff, um, where it seems like some of the, the, the health insurance, as soon as you get to a certain level, you're, you're on your own. Um, I think that's one of the bigger challenges that we're going to face as our company grows because we do want to provide a plan. We want to provide security to our employees to remain with us. Um, Employment-wise, uh, numbers, at least at Dusty Sprinklers, have been good. We decided to reinvest or at least invest in our employees more. And uh, by what I mean is increase our bottom line wage. Um, we currently offer $18 an hour to start. And after two weeks, they're, they're set at a higher rate than that. Um, that has helped us quite a bit. Um, as far as the small bars that we're involved with, we've struggled a little bit harder with the one in Belt. Uh, just trying to attract people. Um, wages are predominantly low in that, in that industry. Um, the Fort Benton facility has been doing quite a bit better, and I'm not sure if that's just a better draw. Um, and Beth, how are people, what's the experience and the differences in rural areas compared to, say, more urban areas in terms of dealing with medical bills, health care costs? One of the CFPB's own studies has shown that um, there is some significant differences. In some cases, there's higher transportation costs, including air ambulances. So how, how, is, how, is, how are medical bills kind of fil filtering through the system here? Um, I don't think I've ever talked with a client who's landed on my desk for debt issues that, that the bulk of it isn't from medical. And I like to clarify a lot of the times that I also talk, you know, a lot of my clients have credit card debt, but not in the way that maybe that I have some credit card debt, right? You know, I bought a raft. They're buying groceries. It's a little bit different. So um, I think the, the sort of rural versus urban, I mean, I, I talk to a lot of clients who face, you know, all sorts of challenges related to their rural location, you know, internet access for one being able to access somebody to get them to a medical appointment in the larger urban area, somebody that has to travel for cancer treatment. You know, I know that some smaller communities are trying to meet some of those needs, but there just aren't providers in some of the areas that our clients are living, and so they, they will often make the choice to forego certain. I mean, I talked to a client recently who assumed that the, um, what's the, the skin cancer doctor, um, a dermatologist, yeah, decided he couldn't, he just couldn't make it work to get to the dermatologist in the community that was like 200 miles away. And so he thought it looked okay, right? I mean, like these are the, the sort of choices that folks are faced with when they can't get to the specialist. So I think, um, you know, one of the things that our office has done to try to sort of get to the more rural communities and to do civil legal screening in medical clinics is to do what's called a medical legal partnership. And that's been a good way for us to, you know, partner with folks in the medical field to try to at least access and, you know, get them. A lot of people don't know they have a civil legal problem. They just don't, they just know they don't have enough money, right, to pay all of their bills. And so that's been a good partnership. But, um, 
you know, a lot of the folks that we are dealing with are only able to access medical providers due to Medicaid expansion. And so there's certainly a large concern right now, specifically with um, the disenrollment that we believe, you know, is going to be starting here soon, that a lot of folks aren't really going to fully understand that they've been disenrolled from Medicaid, may continue to seek those services from providers, and then be dealing with some astronomical bills, um, and not even realize it, since they don't even get an EOB from Medicaid in the first place. So um, the biggest problem is specialists that are in the, quote, you know, urban areas of Montana that they wouldn't necessarily be able to get to because they don't drive anymore. They're, you know, they just don't have that access, but also, um, even when there is a local provider, um, the Medicaid issue is, is going to affect a lot of folks in Montana. Well, I, I want to uh, thank every, we could go on and on about so many things. I'll just say a, a couple, which is that the CFPB is actually very focused on this issue of medical debt and particularly credit reporting around it. You know, all of us, or most of us, have credit reports with the three credit reporting conglomerates, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. Many people report to us that when they have errors on those reports, it's very difficult to fix them, and often we now, our data shows that the most common collection item on a credit report is medical debt now, more than credit cards, more than student loans. And in many cases, people feel they're being called to pay medical debt that they don't even owe or already paid. And when a medical debt is on the credit report that way, that can be seen by many, including em prospective employers, including you know, banks that are giving them credit. And if that is fake and, and as a rumor, um, that's just really not appropriate. We are also very focused on the future of the consumer finance and lending ecosystem. So I mentioned earlier that technology is going to be, play a big role in every single part of America, but especially in rural areas, that it's going to potentially allow people to connect even in, you know, face-to-face, -face, but virtual face-to-face -face conversations in a way that's going to change. There's going to be new things and new offerings that even small banks get to offer in terms of faster payments. But what happens when large tech companies take more and more control? That's a very key place of what we're looking at. We're also looking at what happen, what's happening with new types of products. Many of you, when you shop online or even in a brick and mortar store, are increasingly seeing buy now, pay later. Um, you know, pay in four installments. Um, it's fast growing. Uh, we we b believe that last uh, Christmas season was a blockbuster season for buy now, pay later companies. And we are very eager to work with our state regulators also to figure out how to make sure that we understand what, what's going on in the market and also that individuals understand too. And of course, housing is and mortgages is always going to be one of the very top priorities for us. Um, I think many of us were not sure when COVID was, you know, really raging in 2020, um, what was going to happen to people who, um, you know, couldn't afford their mortgage payments. Now, many were able to enroll in CARES Act forbearances. And we've been very closely watching the transition back to repayment on making sure that those individuals can avoid foreclosure and have alternatives to get into an affordable repayment plan. Commissioner Hall mentioned that one of the things her office provides, we do too, is the ability to get help. And, and truly, you know, because so many mortgages are bought and sold and securitized, it can often be hard to figure out who to even go to. So we are, we are cautiously optimistic that um, foreclosures and, and other mortgage issues are, are not going to be the same calamity that it was, um, you know, f 10 to 15 years ago exactly. So I, I thought I'd just ask um, each of you, 
if there's something brief you wanted to close with, um, it, no pressure. But again, I wanted to thank all five of you, but maybe I'll start again with you, Greg, and then go down the line. Well, I'd like to just visit that uh, foreclosure mitigation. I think that um, I had opportunity with uh, forbearances to visit with literally thousands of um, with folks all, all over the country and speak directly with their servicers. And the difference between uh, the housing crisis and now is that the servicers were more proactive. And, and so we... As a counselor, my, yeah, my count, as my job would be just to help those folks navigate, number one, ex help them understand what the definition of a forbearance is and that it was going to come to an end and that not just to rely on hopefully a modification or some other workout plan. But, and I, too, am working, uh, following up with a lot of those folks that I started with in the, the COVID forbearance um, issues and watching closely as they transition back to... Uh, making regular payments, but I'm very um, pleasantly surprised um, at the landscape this go around that, that the servicers are were much uh, better equipped at least at least to communicate and and allow us housing counselors to help help the homeowners the borrowers to navigate that. We're taught to lead with gratitude, and so I, I want to do that and express sincere gratitude mm -hmm. to you for coming to Montana. Um, for prioritizing our state and the number of different types of issues that we face here. Um, also want to express gratitude for some of the education that's provided. Um, we specifically use the CFPB's Your Money, Your Goals toolkit, the Native American toolkit. We blend that with a lot of our Building Native Communities curriculum, and it's fabulous. Um, I have my staff is today at the local tribal college teaching a financial empowerment series using those tools. Um, and so I'm very grateful for that. Um, I also want to appreciate the comments about the CFPB being concerned with the whole ecosystem. Um, and that's something that, that's become kind of dear to us in our whole business strategy of serving tribal communities. Um, we wanted to create more housing opportunities. To do that, we created a CDFI to work with our clients more holistically because it's the model that we needed to build social and emotional infrastructure because how we feel about money makes a difference in terms of how, how, what it does in our lives and in our communities. And I can't say that enough. It's so much more than just regulating products. It, it's a whole ecosystem of, of how we feel about it, what we know about it, how we interact with it, how we set values in our lives and our communities. Um, and so I just very much appreciate the view that you're looking at, a whole ecosystem. Um, and I'm looking forward to decisions that are made in the future that help the ecosystem of financial services providers relate better and serve consumers better. So thank you. <coughs> I would also just like to echo the, the gratitude and the thanks for um, giving Montana Legal Services a seat at this table. Um, I, I think that um, you know, we certainly also try to employ a pretty holistic approach in, in helping our clients sort out their you know, civil legal issue and you know, working within the community of resources that are available. You know, I, I've referred a lot of clients to Greg over the years because working together, his expertise and my expertise give that client the best options for figuring out what the solutions are to their problems. And um, I also, you know, I, I became a lawyer. I guess I was a baby lawyer before the CFPB existed. And I very much appreciate the guidance that it has provided and some of the tools it's, you know, given me to be able to help my clients when I, I started um, or at the last sort of foreclosure crisis, I was funded to do foreclosure prevention work. And, you know, when the, the, the mortgage servicing regs came out, it was, I mean, I was excited. It was great. And so the CFPB, I, I just appreciate their helping, you know, Montana consumers, helping consumers across the country and, and giving those of us who are trying to enforce consumers' rights a little more, um, I guess, teeth to do so. So thank you. I too wanted to say thank you for being here and allowing us uh, the opportunity um, to understand what small business faces in Montana. Thank you. Oh, I also, if, just if you want to share the names of your bars too, I went to one of them yesterday. <laughs> so. <laughs> Technically, they're my wife. That's true. Bars. They're your yes, wife's. Yeah. That was you, and so, he'd made that very clear. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so the East Side Barn Belt, and 
we just opened, it was called the Bank Club in Fort Benton, uh, it's called the Bank Bar, um, right on the main street in Fort Benton. We're not allowed to endorse, but we can, you know. <laughs> and again, I'd like to thank you guys for coming here and, and experiencing Montana for yourself. Um, I would just ask the CFPB as a whole going forward as you consider new legislation, new rules, whatever, to try and keep a level playing field to where you're not over-regulating one industry and not regulating another. And, you know, if you put more regs on banks but you let dealer loans and stuff do whatever they want, it, it's just going to create more and more of an uneven playing field and just ask you to consider looking at all aspects of financing down the road, not just banks, and also not to, you know, try not to regulate the small banks back out of business even more, so. Well, I, I appreciate um, our whole panel, and it would, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that we are at, you know, uh, a public college, and, um, it didn't come up in the conversation, but something that many of us care deeply about is how much, um, you know, so many people have to borrow to go to school and how it's really challenging to pay back. And so I hope all of us are also thinking about those who attend this school and other schools to make sure that they're leaving and can chart a, a bright economic future rather than just, um, you know, being burdened with, with debt. So. Please give a round of applause to our panelists um, for joining us today. And I'll turn it over to Karen. Great. Thank you, Director Chopra. And again, thank you to our panelists for such a wonderful, thought-provoking, and honest discussion. Wasn't that wonderful? So, unfortunately, uh, the time for the panel has concluded. This concludes officially the panel portion of our program. Um, and at this time, as the panelists uh, return to the audience, we're going to switch over to start the next section of our program. It's very exciting. And I'd like to thank Bruce and Dustin for being great hosts to us yesterday. We had a wonderful time in Belt. Thank you again. So, the fun continues because now we get to hear directly from you and the audience that have signed up to do part of a public conversation. So, one of the ways that the CFPB gathers information about what's happening locally in consumer financial markets is through public uh, input provided at events such as these. And some of you have signed up to share today your comments and observations about today's discussion. What we hear and when we hear from you, it is invaluable. And we want to hear from, many of, uh, from as many of you as possible. So each person who has signed up to provide testimony will have uh, between one and two minutes to do so. I will be keeping time because I do want to make sure that we get a chance to hear from everyone and uh, that we have a robust and healthy discussion, just like we just heard uh, from the panelists. So without further ado, I'm going to call up our first uh, public commenter. Ready, Director? Great. Uh, I will uh, recognize Jennifer Whipple. The microphone will be brought to you. Great. Thank you. Mr. Chopra, thank you for coming to Montana. My name is Jennifer Whipple, and I'm the third generation owner of a collection agency here in Montana. We are a small size agency and a member of the Montana Collectors Association and ACA International. Agencies like mine work with our local and rural consumers across Montana to help them pay past due debts. And we also work for Montana businesses, helping them stay in business in our rural communities. These are our neighbors. We often would ask that you think of us as a relationship and customer service agency in Montana. We save households an estimated $600 a year with our services. By keeping prices low for the services and profit products that our clients offer, we help these businesses stay in business. It's important that these businesses have equal ability to collect and credit report past due items 
so they can remain in our rural communities. ACA members are committed to strong compliance programs and we work hard to meet the member, the needs of our community by allowing them to stay afloat, employ people, and provide credit and services. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> In recent months, the leadership of the CFPB <clears throat> has used a rhetoric about our industry that insinuates that we're made up entirely of bad actors and that we're seeking to harm consumers, particularly in the medical debt collection service industry. This couldn't be farther from the truth. It's offensive to the thousands of women and men in our industry who engage in collections work. In fact, these men and women have spent thousands of our hours, dollars, and resources in the last year into compliance programs and robust programs to meet most recently, the CFPB's Regulation F. I urge the CFPB to engage with all stakeholders and those in our industry, those providing medical debt collection services um, and those providing medical services before making sweeping policy changes in this area that impacts our medical providers, our collectors, and our urban and rural communities here in Montana. We have consumers who need and rely on our medical care, and we want to make sure it's still there to be provided. Thank you. Perfect timing, Ms. Whipple. Great. Make my job so much easier. Thank you. All right. Next, we will hear from... Uh, sorry, the alarm went off. Next, we will hear from Angie Main. Angie? Hello and good morning. Thank you, Director Chopra, for visiting Montana. Um, my name is Angie Main. I'm a uh, director, executive director of NACDC Financial Services, a native CDA, CDFI located on the Blackfeet Reservation. But we serve all of the tribal communities um, in Montana, all eight. Um, when we begin lending in um, I guess what I want to talk about is mostly access to capital, especially from the banking arena. Um, we do provide education, training, and technical assistance and, um, and, and assist our clients to improve credit. Uh, when we began lending in 2011, we had $56,000 in total assets. And this May, we um, ended May, uh, the end of May 2022 with over 12 million in assets, and so we're growing considerably as a native um, CDFI. Um, the mo and the major reason for this is our home loans. We have home loans um, throughout uh, the tribal communities in Montana. We do both the, um, trust and fee um, loans on those um, on those on trust and fee land. Um, right now, we have a, a pipeline of over $4 million in um, not only home loans, but also all of our lending pro products. And this is, again, throughout the tribal communities in Montana. And um, we actually, our, um, our access to capital has been through social investors, um, but we've, you know, we've exhausted a lot of those, um, of those that uh, invested in us. And, um, and I would like to say too that we're proud of um, since the beginning in 2011, we still have a 0% default rate. So we're doing very well at um, assisting our consumers, our clients and our communities to, um, to um, not only access capital, but also to, um, to pay, their, pay their loans. And so, um, um, and I believe that if we had 10 to $12 million in, 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 um, in resources, lending capital, we would be able to get that out the door in actually two to three, probably within the, lot, the next two to three years, if not sooner, because of, um, because of the need. Um, and I would, um, you know, like to, we do have a relationship, I guess, with two banks, um, local banks in our area, but um, again, the CRA is um, not helping. Um, you know, we can't just have a, um, a, a banker on our um, 
I guess, on our boards and consider that um, satisfied CRA. And so, Thank um, you, Ms. Main. Oh, if you gosh. want to wrap up really okay. quickly. Okay, yes. Um, I, I would like to you know, sure. be able to have um, more you know, banking partnerships where we could um, you know, work with them and, and actually help to considerably help, help them to considerably impact Native communities. Um, we could be the conduit to getting you know, this dollars out the door to um, consumers. So thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Danya Parrish. Raise your hand, Ms. Parrish. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you, Dr. Uh, Director Chopra, for being in Montana. We appreciate your focus on the rural initiatives and the special needs that we have here across our state. I work for Montana's credit unions, and we assist credit unions across the state of Montana with helping their members have a brighter financial future. And while none of those credit unions are directly regulated by your industry, we do certainly rely on the resources that you provide. The work through your Office of Older Americans is very important. And we appreciate the ease of access to information on the regulatory side, but I certainly echo the comments that Mr. Hoyer made about the difficulty in compliance with some of those regulations with smaller institutions that may only have a handful of employees. So while we continue to balance the needs of the consumers and the needs of you know, survival of our lifestyle here in Montana, we appreciate your focus and, and willingness here. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Parrish. Next, we'll hear from Terry Brocky. Terry, please raise your hand. Perfect. Oh, hey, I want to welcome you to White Clay Country and Blackfoot Country. We signed treaties in uh, 1855, you know, prior to Great Falls, more or less. So just want to welcome you here and also on behalf of all of us as Montanans. Uh, I just really, uh, you, you talked about three buckets, basically, relationship banking. In a lot of ways, I, I lead our tribe's economic development arm. And uh, when I see relationship banking, it's almost non-existent in some senses. Uh, to the sense of like individually, ag business, small business, and on and on. And it really centers around the, what uh, Ms. Plummer talked about is the trust, trust fee issue and, and, and banks looking at collateral. So, you know, as you think about, you know, policy or whatever, you know, always be thinking about, you know, there's that unique relationship that we have as tribes and, and that presents barriers to access to capital. So it's always access to capital. I sat in the White House one time and listened to every tribe that was there, and that's all they talked about was access to capital. So um, th that's just one thing, specifically like housing. I mean, we've created 400 plus jobs, about 300, and 300 on our reservation, and you know, for them to get a, a checking account, a credit card, a car, we're now we're moving towards housing. And really, uh, HUD 10% of, of the 184, which was created as a loan product on reservations, only 10% do it on, on the reservation. So um, uh, you look at the USDA rural development loans, they're non-existent on reservations. You look at the VA, since 2011, a little over 20, 250 loans is all have been processed on trust lands. And so these are huge barriers. We're in a, we're in a housing crisis. Um, we're just trying to create a housing market, okay? It took me 22 months to get my home through a 184 loan pro product, 22 months. I could have went, I was gonna work for the state in the Office of Public Instruction. I'd have been in my house in six weeks. And so that took, that, there's layers because we have to deal with tribal government, federal government. We're the most regulated people in the world. We have code 25 CFR that regulates us. I have to define who I am as a Native American. So l less regulation and freedom allows us to do that. And so just transactional ba banking, you know, uh, you know we, we have to jump through all kinds of hoops, just on and on. And I can address it on another date, so understood. Thank you so much. It's what, lovely when I can just give the eye and I don't have to actually say anything. <laughs> Appreciate the, the great nonverbal communication. Next we'll hear from Ching King. Please raise your hand. Oh, wonderful. I got one minute. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Oh, I just want to uh, say uh, 
you know, uh, I, I look at all the regulations, like uh, Terry Brock, you were saying, you are the most, we are the most regulated people. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I just want to say my, the investment I see is in our, our veterans, <clears throat> our, our people who are in, uh, in foster care. You know, I, it, it's sad to see a lot of our students that are, some of them are 4.0 average in high school, are on the streets <clears throat> in Haver. And I've seen one of my <clears throat> nephews Saturday or Sunday. I didn't know he was, uh, he was walking on the streets or sitting there down and out, a top-notch basketball <clears throat> player. And so you see all of those uh, investing into our, our, our people, you know, and that's what Island Mountain does is, is to help build our people. You know, there's a lot of domestic violence uh, that nobody wants to take care of the, the victims, you know. And so <clears throat> the investment is to help the employees that are down and out and build them up, you know. I think that's one of the things that, <clears throat> that I don't see with any banking industry or anybody is what do we do to help our veterans, you know, that are on the streets? You know, I, I see a lot of those, even our, um, you know, combat vets, you know, that's, that's what I don't see, is, is looking at that. So hopefully banks and others will help us in, invest into our people. You have a little bit more time, is that it? <laughs> Not that much more. So, so I, I, I want to say that, uh, you know, uh, I lost a sister-in-law <clears throat> here in Great Falls from domestic violence. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Um, next, we will hear from Brett Doney. Please raise your hand, Mr. Doney. Hi, thank you. I'm Brett Downey. I run the Great Falls Development Authority. We're an economic development nonprofit, CDFI. I've been running CDFIs since CDFIs were, were created 30 years ago. Uh, I want to echo Tanya's uh, comments. Uh, first, it's, it's so great to have you here. Frankly, what the Federal Reserve usually offers us is a luncheon speaker. We need capital. Our banks and credit unions are doing a fantastic job. We share the concern about overregulation, which has, is driving out the smaller uh, institutions. We were approved as a PPP lender. We never had to make a single PPP loan because every client we had, we were able to find a local bank or credit union that would make the loan. Our role is to do pieces of projects or projects that the banks and credit unions can't do, and we don't have enough capital. Two things that, that you could do to really make a difference in Montana. One is to go back and turn your powerful searchlight internally to the Federal Reserve and say, why don't you help out community-based and tribally-based CDFIs? Uh, not the big multi-state CDFIs. They play a role, but, but the community-based CDFIs, we don't have near enough capital. I, I, I have bankers and credit union lenders in the room right now coming to us with deals, we, we can't fill the gap, and we don't have access to enough capital. Uh, the second thing is to, is to solve these tribal uh, credit issues. I mean, this year after year after year, and D.C. has to do something just to solve these issues. It, it's stifling housing production. It stifles entrepreneurship. And um, uh, it's, it's not a creation here in Montana, as has been mentioned. It, it, this was all created in D.C., so it's a, it, it painful to watch people's lives impacted by artificial constraints. We have enough challenges with real issues, but to have these artificial constraints that hold back what we need uh, to do here is uh, uh, very frustrating. Thank you. Thank you. And next, we will hear from Mr. Tom Jacobson. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, and I want to thank the director. Uh, my name is Tom Jacobson. I'm the executive director for Rural Dynamics here in Great Falls. Uh, my moonlight is a state senator, and uh, I just cannot thank you enough for, uh, for coming here and recognizing uh, not just rural, but rural Montana. Um, you know, my dad uh, ran a small bank in Randall, Iowa. I moved out here in 89. Um, you know, and after he passed, I couldn't tell you the number of people who came to me and, and shared their stories about how he was able to um, impact the lives of the people, not just through the agricultural loans, because, I mean, Randall, Iowa is 250 people, right? But through his guidance, his, you, you mentioned um, personal banking and personal relationships. It was, that was at the core of what he did. And today, banking is much different. Finance is, is you know, a, a million miles from where we were back in the 70s and 80s. And what we've lost is that, that ability to connect. I've had the opportunity to work with the CFPB pretty much since its inception over three different administrations. And um, I've had a, you know, I, I commend your, uh, you know, the Office of Consumer Education and External Affairs for the resources they provide. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, what my job is is to provide that resource, that personal relationship that I think we're missing a lot now. And so it's the rural banks, it's the agricultural aspect that drives their balance sheets, but also provides the opportunity for home loans and having that personal connection, vehicle loans and having that personal connection, running into issues and having you know, that, that person to call and to be. My, my organization attempts to be that, but we can't be all things to all people. And so what we're seeing with the growth of the CDFIs, especially in Native communities, is huge. And they are now playing that role of personal relationship banker that we've lost. And so I, I echo the comments for Native communities. I echo the need for um, looking after rural. And, you know, rural Montana, if you've been to rural Montana, is, is similar, but it's it's different than rural Mississippi. It's different than rural Iowa. And recognizing those differences and, and playing to, to those, and whether it's regulation or whatnot, you know, uh, understanding those issues. And I applaud you for coming out here and trying to understand those. So thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes the, uh, the public comments. And I'd like to just take a moment to thank you all who took the time to travel here to share your very uh, important thoughts, guidance, your requests, and in some cases, heartbreaking experiences. Our hearts are with you. Uh, obviously, we are dedicated public servants and passionate about this work. And I, Director Chopra leads us in a way to make sure that we want all consumers to know that um, your mat what matters to you matters to us. And so, to move things along, I just would, again, like to thank you all for being here today. I'd like to thank the panelists for the robust discussion that they uh, participated in. And to all those watching via live stream at consumerfinance.gov, we thank you for joining us. And obviously, to the Montana State University, thank you for enabling us, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, to host this event here today. Just a reminder that today's event was recorded and will be on the CFPB's website in the coming weeks. This, regrettably, concludes the CFPB's town hall uh, in Great Falls, Montana. Enjoy the rest of your day, travel safe, and thank you again for the warm hospitality in this beautiful big sky country. It's been an honor to be here with you. <laughs>